your greatness. We acknowledge your power. We acknowledge your creation. We acknowledge your mandate. We know, Lord, when you give a mandate, you are able to empower to fulfill it. The time has come, Lord, for you to speak to us. We prepare our hearts to receive from you. Speak from your throne of grace. Bless us from above. Thank you, Father, for answered prayers. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The title of the message this morning is Fulfilling the Creation Mandate. Fulfilling the Creation Mandate. When God created human beings, he gave them a mandate. And that mandate was simple and straightforward. That mandate was both a command and a blessing. He says, be fruitful and multiply. And have dominion over living creatures. That was the mandate. The first command that God gave to man after creation. This mandate gave man the responsibility to take care of the earth and its creatures. You know, today, human beings are doing a lot of things that are destroying the earth. That's not the mandate God gave to us. Not to destroy the earth. The mandate was to take care of the earth. So like I said, the creation mandate is both a command and a divine blessing. In the passage we read, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. The Bible says, and God said, let us create man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And then the mandate. And God blessed them. And God said unto them. This is the first word after creation. God said unto them. Be fruitful and multiply. And replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that creepeth upon the earth. If you look at that mandate in this passage, 
there are four dimensions of the mandate. The first dimension says, be fruitful and what? Multiply. The second one, replenish the earth. The third one, subdue the earth. And the third one, have dominion. So that is the first command God gave to us as human beings. That is the first mandate that God gave to us. So the first dimension, be fruitful and multiply. God wants families to grow and multiply, not addition. Like we illustrated last week, when you add two in five places, two plus two plus two plus two plus two, plus two you get only ten. But if it's multiplication, when you multiply two by two, you get what? Four. Times two, eight. Times two, sixteen. Times two, thirty-two. So what God, the way God wanted our life is not through addition, but multiplication. And God, but remember that this command. God actually gave the command to animals before man. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 22, God gave the same command to be fruitful and multiply to animals. But you know, animals procreate instinctively. That's why you can see animals, they don't know yourself. They just see each other for road. You know, they just procreate. But Human beings procreate purposefully. That's the difference between human beings and animals. God created us and gave us the power of choice. You know, human beings have to choose intentionally what to do. And I'm sure you know, anytime you have done any wicked thing, you know it. Eh? And you do it. Anytime you are choosing to do a good thing, you also know it. So intentionally. If you go somewhere, you enter your friend's room, or your brother's room, or your relation, or your parent's room, or your, your child's room, and you see a bundle of money. And nobody knows that you enter the room. Whether to decide to pick some, or not pick, it's a question of what? Choice. Choice. It's choice. There are situations you know that nobody will ever see you. There is no opportunity of being caught, but yet you don't pick the money. It is what? It's choice. It's choice. But the message is that God wants us to be fruitful and to multiply. The second dimension is replenish the earth. The Hebrew word translated replenish simply means to fill. So when God created human beings, he said, look, fill the entire earth. So what does that mean? Travel, move on all parts and occupy all parts of the earth. But you know human beings like, you know, they like things that are easy. They like pleasure. And the Bible tells us <clears throat> in uh, Hebrew, uh, Gen Genesis chapter 11 that when human beings were moving, they were moving as God instructed. They got to the plain of Shina. And they said, look, this plain is flat. You know, human beings don't like mountains. They like a uh, plain. If you look at history of towns and villages, how villages were formed, you will notice that the people who founded those villages, when they got to a place and they see a plain land, I think it's only maybe in uh, Nasarawa. <laughs> and if you look at their history, you will notice that it may be uh, as a result of war that they climb to, to those mountains. Otherwise, human beings like plain. Anywhere they see plain land, 
they see water, they will do what? They will settle. So God created human beings and said, fill the whole earth. But what happened? When they got to the plain of Shino, they decided to settle there. And they said in that place, say, look, this place is very good. You know, that is in Hebrews chapter 11. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east and they found a plain in the land of Shina and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. God said, fill the whole earth. But when they got there, they said, no, there is a plane here. Let's make a tower that goes to heaven. So that we do what? We will make a name for ourselves. You know, that is the problem with many human beings. When you want to, when you go into business, or you go into a career, you want to make money. The first thing is, I want to make a, a name. That when I blow, them go, no. To make a name. So it has been there from Genesis. Human beings wanting to make name. For themselves. But you know, and this is a lesson to all of us that if you want to do anything that is not in the original purpose of God, God can scatter it. And what happened? The Bible says God confused their language. And then as they were bring, uh, building, <laughs> This one was speaking, this one was not hearing again. And confusion came, and the tower of Babel was no longer built. And the Bible says they were now scattered all over the world. The third dimension is subdue the earth. When you say subdue the earth, it means to tame the earth. Because when God created the animals, created man, he didn't create houses. He didn't create garden parks. He didn't create motor parks. But he gave human beings the knowledge to tame the earth and to make it suitable for human use. That's why you see every day new inventions are coming up. And let me tell you, more inventions are going to come up. Because that is the way God planned the world. That will be human beings will have knowledge to tame the earth. To bring new inventions that will make life more comfortable. That is why, you know, when the plague of COVID-19 came, we were sure that it was going to... <laughs> that no plague in this world can make every human being to perish. That it will kill some people. Our own attitude to it is God protect us. And then we as human beings know what we can avoid. So that when he ultimately God gives the knowledge for the plague to go the plague will be able to go. So God has given us knowledge. And that's why you should be thinking, whatever you are doing, whatever work you are doing, how do you make human beings better? In fact, if you look at it, all the people who have made serious money, whether believers or unbelievers, there are people who try to make life better for human beings. So, it's a command 
given by God at creation. It's a creation mandate. And then finally, to have dominion. To have dominion is to rule. And that tells us that the first commandment God gave to us is to rule. So we are rulers. God created us and he meant us to rule. But these four commands were destroyed when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I'm sure you all know the story. When serpent came and deceived Eve to eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge and good and, or, and evil. And also gave it to Adam, the husband, to eat. And then that creation mandate was affected. However, you know, even though creation mandate was affected, the command to human beings to continue to be fruitful and multiply was still there. But it was accompanied by pain and sorrow. He told the woman that bearing children, we heard the testimony of our sister just now about, and he said, you know, he said one thing. Say, women who have uh, experienced labor, they know what it is. That was where he came from. And then he said for the man that you will labor before, if not initially, the Garden of Eden was given free for them to just eat anything they want, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But because of that, problem came. But you know, if you have a plan, if you have a purpose for doing something, and as you are doing it, problem come along the way, what will you do? You go back and think how to make sure that original purpose is a uh, fulfilled. So that is why God now brought Jesus Christ to the rescue. So that he will fulfill the original mandate that God gave to us. So Jesus Christ was born to save us from sin and bondage. In Matthew chapter 1 verse 21, the Bible says, and she brought forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So Jesus Christ was born to save us from that sin which Adam and Eve committed. And Jesus came that we will live life more abundant. In John chapter 10 verse 10 b, the Bible says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The life of abundance is a life of multiplication. Jesus died for us to rule. Remember, one of the mandates is to rule, is to have dominion. So Jesus came now because that ruling was stopped at the fall of man. But Jesus now came back to reestablish for us to rule. And that is why Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 to 6 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and did what? Washed us from our sins in his own blood, the reason, and had made us what? Kings and priests, unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And Revelation chapter 5 verse 10 says, and has made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Jesus commanded us to continue multiplication through the Great Commission. So, how do we fulfill the mandate? This mandate that God has given to us to be fruitful and multiply, to replenish the earth, to subdue the earth, and to have dominion. How can we fulfill that mandate? Number one is to understand the mandate itself. The first step to fulfilling the creation mandate 
is understanding the mandate. We must understand that the first command that God gave to human beings is to be fruitful and multiply. And this requires work in harmony with the earth, not to destroy the earth. Number two is teaching others to fulfill the mandate. The Bible is very clear. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he said, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same coming down to faithful men who are able to teach others also. Number three is to do the work to fulfill the mandate. There is a work that needs to be done to fulfill the mandate. For us to fulfill the mandate that God gave to us, the first commandment at creation, we need to do some work. The first thing is to be fruitful and to multiply in every aspect of our lives. Either in your spiritual life, in your family, in health, in your academics, in your career, in your finance, in your investment and your relationship. That are eight things that we plan for every year. We must strive to be fruitful. Number two is to subdue the earth. How do you subdue the earth? Work and make innovations and inventions that make the earth better and do not destroy the earth. I challenge all of you today, whatever profession you are in, try to make the world better with what you do. And then finally, is to have dominion in every aspect of life. Bible scholars have identified seven mountains by which we need to have dominion. The first is religion. You know, religion has a powerful impact on the character, conduct, and values of people and the trajectory of society. I don't know whether you have seen <clears throat> situations where people come, somebody who killed their parents, they will say, I forgive you. No natural man can do that. It's only the impact of the spirit of God that can make that happen. So, when a person gives his life to Jesus, he becomes a new creature. And everything about that person changes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. As children of God, we need to influence the world with our thoughts, with our words and with our action, through our prayers, through witnessing, through mission, through the word, and through deliverance. As believers, there are signs that are to follow us. The Bible says, These signs shall follow them that believe. The Bible did not say, these believers shall follow signs. In this age, instead of signs following believers, believers are running after signs and wonders. And because people know that all kinds of native doctors and 419ers have now planned how to make believers to run after signs. So that today you hear of any miracle. It's only a foolish man that will believe it at first sight in this world today. If you hear any of any miracle, you will look very well. Whether it's true or fake. So we must 
as authentic believers, we must, as true believers, preach the right word. You know? I don't support coming, using the people, calling people's name and uh, criticizing them. But we must preach the correct word. We must train the people to become true priests and kings. So that when they see the fake believers, they will be able to do what? To know them. And the Bible says, know the truth and the truth will set you free. Economy and finance. As Christians, we need money for feast and pleasure. Money is not a bad thing. The time that Christians think that money is evil, is gone. Money is not evil. Money is good. In fact, in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 19, he said a feet is made for laughter and wine make it merry but money answered all things but remember money only answers things concerning pleasure money does not answer all things in life you know otherwise all these billionaires will not die of sickness if money answered uh, all things. But money answered all things concerning pleasure. No matter how spiritual you are, if you don't have money at all, you will suffer. You will not be able to have pleasure. And there is no reason, are you listening to me, why you should be very spiritual and you don't have money. You say contradiction. Why you should be very spiritual and you don't have money? Because the Bible is very clear. Whether in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 29, verse 11, he said, I know the plans I have for you, the plans to prosper you. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, I am, it is I who give thee the power to what? To create wealth. Or in the New Testament, 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prosper. So, whatever you look at it, it's a contradiction for you to be very spiritual and born into poverty and die in poverty. You know, it is possible, but it will be a question of choice. Just like that prophet, who was a good prophet, he died and left death for his two children. And they wanted to take the children as a slave. The Bible did not tell us that he was a bad prophet. He was a good uh, prophet. So I don't know which one you want to choose. You want to be a good Christian, live here in poverty, die in poverty, and go to heaven, or a good Christian, live here in prosperity, and go to heaven. The choice is uh, yours. But you know, <laughs> there are things you have to do to operationalize this choice. You know, you can make money by sowing spiritual and physical seeds. You know, <laughs> This is why many Christians remain poor. They fail to sow seed. You know, or rather, they have turned the seed to giving money to the pastor. Are you with me? It is biblically correct that if you want to be prosperous, if you want financial prosperity, you must sow seed. But it is not true that if you want to prosper, you must carry all your money and give to pastor. You must sow two kinds of seed. Spiritual seed and physical seed. Spiritual seed is your tithe, your offering, your giving to men of God. It's just one of them. 
Are you with me? But many people emphasize as if that is the only uh, seed. Your tithe, your offering, giving to men of God, giving to house of God, giving to fellow believers, and giving to the poor. Like I have always stated, this thing is like a formula. And do you know how formula works? If one of them is missing, what happens? You can't balance. It's error. So you must give your tithe, give your offering, give to men of God, give to house of God, give to fellow believers, and give to the poor. But that is half of it. If you do all these ones <laughs> and you don't do business, you will still remain poor or barely surviving. The second aspect is physical seed, which your investment of money that will bring to you more money. You know, don't be afraid that people have invested and their money is missing. Huh? And every day you tell us that you have been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Huh? And that the Holy Spirit is in you. Hmm? Why can't you ask the Holy Spirit to direct your steps in your business uh, investment and business decisions? So, when you invest money into business, you reap returns on investment. In fact, the Bible enjoins us to work smart and be diligent. Because what we've seen is that the richest people are not the most hardworking in terms of physical uh, work. Otherwise, anyway, by the way, are there still truck pushers? There are still truck pushers, eh? Where did they push them? <laughs> because the one we know, uh, no, they're not trying. Uh, we battle pushers, we get now, not be truck. You know, in those days, eh, truck is made of wood. And then you will see the guy behind it. See muzzle. And they go to the market, they carry a load, and they will be pushing. In fact, some of them have guy name like Egbe Weja. Because they have power. But they walk like elephant and eat like ants. So, as children of God, walk smart and be diligent. Have financial knowledge and have diversified source of income. More importantly, invest in what we give you returns. Especially a time is coming where you will not be able to work. And look, listen, don't depend on your children. The time of depending on your children is gone. You know the children always go to meeting on Facebook. They went to a meeting on Facebook and there was a debate, huge debate on Facebook on whether children should take care of their parents. And the conclusion was that no. That they brought them to this world. They should take care of them. And that it's not their responsibility to take care of their parents. That's what these young people Gen Z, that's what they have decided. In our own time, your mother, your father, in my own case, my father died when I was just six years. So your mother, was, in fact, my mother actually sold her bicycle to pay school fees for my elder brother. Sold the bicycle. I was grown up, we saw her sold the bicycle at giveaway price. But you know what? When my 
elder brother finished school and started work as a teacher in a primary school, one of the first major assignments was to buy a new bicycle for my mother. And he bought bed. How do I explain that? Eh? Bed that have uh, all those uh, these things for net. And when he brought the bed from Sapele, they had to stand it outside in the compound for everyone to see it. That's what children do to parents. That if parents sew their clothes to take care of you, when you start work, the first thing is to take care of them. And like I stated earlier, several times, my mother, when she was alive, she was on regular salary. And she was, I was giving her at that time just 10,000 naira every month. And she was like the World Bank in the village. Anybody want to borrow money, they will go to her. Because of what? 10,000. And that 10,000 was not a big dent on my pocket. So what I'm trying to say is that, look, plan your life. So both spiritual and physical seed to make money and live in financial freedom and do things to advance the kingdom of God. As you do that, the almighty God will help you in Jesus' name. Amen. The next is, the third one is entertainment, arts, and culture. We know that opinion and conduct can be formed and sustained through entertainment, arts, and culture. There is the need for involvement of Christians to promote Christian morality. There should be Christian tailors who sew wedding gown that does not open breast. You know, if you go to the market today, you want to buy ready-made wedding gown, you will not find a single one that will not lead to opening of breast. So there is need for Christian tailors. There is need for Christian musicians. There is need for Christian hostels. There is need for Christian hotels with Holy Ghost environment. No alcohol, no smoking, no prostitutes. There are some already, but there is a need for more. So that, you know, you know, there is a way in which if you don't do it, it will seem as if you are either stupid or you are not, you, you know, open, for what they will say, you know, open eye. So you will see a young girl who all his or her life does not make up. Huh? On wedding day, they will produce a different person. I'm telling you, uh, these are things I've seen. All her life, she does not make up at all. Or if she makes up, very light, very simple. But on wedding day, people will take over. In fact, she has no say. When the person comes out, you see a painted Jezebel. And it's quite different from her character and from her conduct. And you know, many of these influences, sisters, brothers, they are so powerful that you are powerless. You can't even say anything. Even I've seen situations where the people did not like it. Yet they had nothing to do. What we are saying is that if you are a Christian, be a Christian. Don't be carried away by entertainment, by art, by culture of the world. Be yourself and make sure you stand your grounds. There are many people, you know, they don't drink alcohol, they don't give alcohol, 
During marriage ceremony, they are forced. They cannot stand. They will even be able to say anything. The scripture that says the spirit we have is that of boldness. We disappear. Because they want to marry. They are not able to say no. I will not buy alcohol. I will not give alcohol. Even some will be worried. What will their friends say if they come and don't see uh, alcohol? So they have two plans. One plan for church people. And another plan for non-church people. You know, that is why you see even many pastors during a wedding reception, they don't want to go. So that they don't see. Because this is your good member who always raise holy hands and blast in tongues when you read the wedding ceremony. Uh, or the, the music from beginning to end, what the music? When they want to appear and dance in, <laughs> you will be surprised that this is the person you will know that you don't know them. <laughs> they will show themselves on that uh, day. So, what we are saying that no, there's Christian music, there's Christian dance. A am I communicating? There is a way a Christian lady should dance. You can't make suggest. You there's what you call suggestive dancing. You know. So we must know that we should dominate. In fact, as a Christian lady, you know, there are many places where I played father. I will insist. If you don't play Christian music, I will not dance. You can play all the other words, but if it's me, if it's up to me to do the dancing, you have to play Christian music. We must show our entertainment. Governance and politics is about service to humanity. Christianity is about service to God and humanity. That's why Jesus Christ said, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And as children of God, we must be involved in governance and politics. Because, let's be clear, we are in the 21st centuries. In the first three centuries, the church was separated from the state. But there was denunciation of corrupt leadership by the church. But the Catholic church was the only church at that time. And at the time, the Catholic church was incorporated into government. And the church became a department of the state. But there was a move for separation of the state from the church. And the church today is separated from the state. But know that at one time, the church and the state were fused. And the bishop of a place was the governor of the place. So don't tell me that Christians should not participate in politics. What kind of Christians are you talking about? What history are you referring to? Okay? Because today... Ignorance is making a lot of people to say things that they know nothing about. So that is why we are advocating that the church should lead the crusade for good governance in principles and values. There is what we call ethics and morality in politics. Today, there is no ethics, there is no morality in politics because you don't have people who fear God. You have people who have only one agenda. In politics. What is that agenda? To steal. to steal money. That's the only agenda. To steal money. We can't have such people in politics and think that life will be better for us. Because it's politics that determines whether the price of where. It's politics that determines the price of electricity. It's politics that determines whether rules are tied. It's politics that will determine the quality of school. Many of us attended public primary school, public secondary school, and public university. I know, I know how many of your children here you have in public primary school. They have destroyed it completely. When I was in the university, twice a week, one person will have half chicken. Half chicken. One chicken divided into two, half to you, on 
you know you can't forget the time. Wednesday evening and Sunday afternoon. And the cost was 50 kobo, not 50 naira. 50 kobo. My annual, my monthly allowance at that time was 100 naira. And I buy the whole uh, booklet for one month, three times every day for 45 naira. One packet shirt at that time was five naira. So I can still buy uh, my ticket, buy one packet shirt, and still have 50 naira remaining to use. So this is what all of these people who are my age mates ruling this country now, what they enjoyed. But they cannot pass that to their own children. But you should not allow that. You should not allow that. And the only way that you cannot allow it is to participate in politics. Fifth is education. Education is a device that trains in all aspects of human being to enable him or her to live amicably in her environment. Education can be transmitted through formal and informal means. Education creates awareness and inculcates values, morals, and culture and improves skills, knowledge, and attitudes. You can't claim to be, education is not certificate. There are many certificated illiterates. So Christians should be involved in both formal and informal education. If you have the capacity and opportunity, establish primary schools. Who will tell you that in your school they will not pray? as they do in some schools today. Establish secondary school. If you have the capacity, establish university where morality, Christian ethics will be taught, where it will be incorporated, where discipline, where things will be done properly so that we can produce a society that we are all proud of. Media is a powerful tool of molding public opinion, setting agenda and faction. Christians have a duty to engage the media to promote godly values and promote the kingdom of God on heaven. Many of you are on social media. What do you do with your social media? There are some of you here you have never preached on your social media. In fact, they don't know whether you are a Christian, a Muslim, or pagan in your social media. Can you make a commitment today that your social media pages will be used to promote the kingdom of God? You can get connected to the social media handles of the church and make sure that anytime you open your social media, you go to the church pages just to do three things. To like, to share, and to comment. If you don't even have anything to connect, just write, praise God. Or you write, we are priests, we make disciples. If you are doing that, or you write, amen. If you are doing that, you are pushing the word of God. You are preaching the word of God. You are fulfilling the great commission. Family. The institution of family was ordained by God. The family is the bedrock of any nation. It is the family that the character and values of children are formed. Christian homes are enjoyed to build. Christians are enjoyed to build Christian homes and train their children in the way of the Lord. Today, a lot of marriages are challenged. The rate of divorce is so high. We need to go back to the family. I've always argued that if the two people are good Christians and they are in correct relationship with God, there will be no problem in the marriage. If problem comes, it will be solved easily. It's whether when one or both of them has strayed away from the presence and direction of God, that is where problems uh, arise. I pray that the Almighty God will help our families in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to ask you, my dear brothers and sisters, are you a born-again child of God? Have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Are you saved from the bondage of sin? Are you living a life of abundance? Are you reigning as kings and priests? Are you multiplying disciples? Are you dominating in any area of life? 
I want to let you know this morning that God created human beings with a mandate to be fruitful and multiply. The fall of man affected the creation mandate. But Jesus came to rescue, to the rescue of fulfilling that mandate of creation. You have been saved from the bondage of sin. You can now live a life of abundance. You can now rule and reign as kings and priests. You should continue multiplication of other disciples. I want to assure you that our God is more than able to make you to fulfill mandate. Trust this God. Continue to serve him. Continue to worship him. I'm sure from your own even testimonies, you've seen how great this God is. Nobody can be greater than God. Let nobody deceive you. Our God is faithful. For each and every one of you, he will make you to be fruitful and to multiply in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Do something new. Something new in my life. Something new in my life. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Do something new in my life. Something new. morning we're going to anoint everyone i sanctify the anointing oil in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit this special anointing service is for multiplication special anointing service for multiplication as you anoint yourself today, every area of your life will be multiplied in Jesus' name. You will experience multiplication and you will testify to the Lord's goodness. Oh Lord, my God. Voice and the clouds. Speak it out and shout.